queer therapies. Welcome Nadine Shaheen, Dr. <laughs> Nadine Shaheen. <coughs> so um, Nadine is a Lebanese type designer. Uh, she's the CEO of I Love Type from Free Limited and Principal at Arabic Type. Uh, she has an MA in typeface design uh, from the University of Reading and a PhD from Leiden University in uh, the Netherlands and a Master of uh, Studies in International um, Relations from Cambridge University. Amazing. <laughs> That's how it, start. it starts. <laughs> so, um, Nadine has uh, joined Linotype in 2005 and she stayed um, at Mono Monotype. Yeah, Linotype, yeah, Monotype. And she uh, stayed till 2018. That's the reason why she worked. Um, <clears throat> um, uh, sorry. This uh, dog sheep, right? Um, uh, I would I um, uh, uh, tell all the awards that all the awards that she won at the time they were to club in New York, um, and all the others uh, awards that she won, but there are so many. Um, so um, uh, I I want <coughs> to. To say that Nadine was uh, gave a lecture in 2015 at Pipe Paris, and um, the lecture she gave is online. So uh, please go and uh, and see the, the lecture she, she gave. And it was the first. It was the first edition of uh, Pipe Paris. The first night. Okay. <laughs> she was the first one. Okay. So she's the first one for many, many things. Oh, she's the first to come back. Ah! She's amazing. Let's say, to be short. But um, I, I've seen the, this lecture again, and that. There was something I was very interested in. Um, so sorry, I'm reading, but um, there is something very interesting she said about her work uh, and how she was thinking about being a typeface designer at, at the time. Um, so um, she, she says that uh, so quote. We cannot talk about design without its, its relationship with culture and politics. Uh, and she said that she was uh, talking about her own uh, position about that. But I thought it was very interesting. And saying that it was much more crucial when it was about Middle East and about Arabic typefaces. And it was 2015. We are now 2022. She also uh, did an amazing project when there was this amazing blast, horrible uh, blast in Beirut, um, and there was this beautiful um, project to help people that, that were living in Beirut at the time. So I think it's very interesting. Also, uh, her position. Because she also said, quote again, um, when we are designers, we are citizens first. And again, seven years after, I think it means so much about the world in which we are living now. So, um, yes, just uh, we are so happy to... Uh, uh, to receive Madin uh, again in Thai Paris. So please welcome Warren Lee.
Merci Véronique, euh, merci à Jean-François pour l'invitation. Madame et Monsieur, bonsoir. <laughs> and this is the extent of, like, extent of my French. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> well, I know like two words more, but I said to say hello also, like so you see my face before I have to put them on. Can I take a picture? Ah, yes, yes, now is an excellent opportunity. <laughs> <laughs> I have the same smile on the photos. I call it a Facebook smile. Super fake, but it looks good. <laughs> okay, so now that we've laughed, I um, I'm going to spend a few minutes. Well, I'm going to spend a few minutes to depress everyone, and then hopefully I can like sort of lift the mood again. But I think Ronit made an excellent introduction and really like hit to the heart of the issue that we are citizens first, and that this has a meaning in whatever um, thing that we do. Uh, one of the most influential talks that I ever heard was the uh, graduation speech that the late Edward Said gave at my graduation in the year 2000. Now you know how old I am. I was already graduating university. Okay? And, um, and he was saying that we cannot hide behind our professions no matter what that profession is, that there is a duty to our society and culture as citizens before that of our uh, professions and careers. Uh, and so it's really important to keep this in mind. This is where I will start to depress you. So for everyone watching this later on YouTube, and maybe 10 years if civilization remains, <laughs> hopefully yes. Um, but basically, so we are in June 2022. Uh, we are in a transitional uh, social uh, international world order from a unipolar moment where the US was the superpower into a multipolar world where the US, China, and Russia are the superpowers and they fight over control of countries in their region. This is what you are currently seeing today in Ukraine. But there is also designs on Taiwan and that would come at some point. We don't know if it will be an invasion or not. But this is something on the cards and to be expected in the next decade. So basically, while the current Chinese presidency is still in power. So we see that is happening. We also have, so we have of the three, two authoritarians and one liberal democracy that is currently under attack from part of its one of two main political powers. And there has been a lurch to the right wing that is practically by now fascist. And we see this today, if you go, there's the January 6th commission investigating the attack on the Capitol in the US. And uh, this puts us in a very scary position that for the first time in, I think, many, many decades or centuries, that the superpowers are all potentially, within a few years, all of them illiberal. So, if the GOP takes the House in November, Trump will be president in 24, legally or illegally, by which time the US will have turned into an illiberal democracy, as you can see in Hungary, for example, and the uh, facade of elections will be only a facade to be discussed over and contested by placing judges in the right places, by all sorts of political means to influence and it is no longer, no longer actually a functioning democracy, which really puts us at peril from a political standpoint. But we also have peril from a crisis in the climate that we will experience in a couple of days here in Paris, where we will have scorching temperatures that are not expected at this time of the year. And this is a preview of what is to come and not an exception. But we are also uh, depressing everyone, no? So, <laughs> Yeah, I hope there will be nicer things, but we need to work. That's the whole point. Anyways, but yeah. So um, we are also still, and I would argue, we are still in a global pandemic, even though the majority of society has decided that COVID is over. But in reality, it is not. And we will see that in any case, if we look for the right clues. So this is where we are. We also expect, but well, not we, like experts expect, that we will have more pandemics because of the encroachment from human territory onto wildlife and closer contact between humans and wildlife. And therefore, viruses jumping from monkeys and pigs and birds into humans and becoming novel viruses that can do what COVID has done. And so these are risks. And at this point, like in 2015, 
I was saying it's important to be a citizen first because the Middle East is on fire and my country is fucked. So now <laughs> the whole world is on fire and everybody is fucked. So, so I would hope that we are, like, if there is one thing that we could take out of this, and I'm asking it ahead of you rather than at the end of the call, uh, not call, sorry, uh, talk, <laughs> is that we try to ask the questions I ask myself to ask of each other of what we can do. And, and so now I will get into it. So um, sorry for the depressing bit, but it's really important because I don't think humanity was ever facing the challenges we are facing today. And it is quite scary that there is no truth anymore because there is an attack on the truth, there is an attack on experts, and there is a capture of government by lobbyists. You see it everywhere, particularly with the dependence on oil. And so any logical way we can try to fix the problems is being called partisan, and we are letting private shareholder interest ruin the only planet we get to live on. Like, we can send Elon Musk into space. I think that's a good idea. Maybe he should stay there as well. But the rest of us, we are here. There's no other place to go. And there is no other countries. Like, we can move countries, but shit is everywhere these days. So in any case, so uh, yeah, I think the depressing part should be like maybe, OK, move on to the actual lecture. Um, yeah, so this presentation is sort of a combination of what I did at Cambridge and then what I do in my type design. And uh, my dissertation at Cambridge, where I was studying politics, international relations, I was focusing on the structures of power in the Middle East. And, and so based on that, we really need to understand what is power. So how do we define it? And I would argue that power is a past, present, and future currency of international relations, but also of national relations, and the interpersonal relations, and actually any kind of relationship. Once you take that view, then you see that when two people are speaking, often there is a fight over power. When you see couples at home fighting, there is a struggle over power. Sometimes there is power sharing, and that is a healthy relationship, but often there is a struggle over power. And so we really need to understand what is power, and eventually what we as designers can do. So to answer that question, I will look at the uh, most important definition according to international relations theory. So this is Robert Dahl, he wrote this in 1957. He says, so A, as an actor A, has power over actor B to the extent that he can get B to do something that B would not otherwise do. There is another interesting uh, aspect of another definition um, by Arendet, uh another political scientist, where she says that power is power when you actually exercise it. You don't have power until you've exercised it. So it's in the act of it. It's not something you hold in you. So it's in the ability to influence what somebody, somebody else is doing. So my own definition, part of my dissertation, was a little bit of a tweak of that. That power is the ability of actor A to influence the actions, the preferences, and in some cases, the identity of actor B. And we will see how. So what are the different forms of power? How does power manifest itself? So there are three. And this is, these are my definitions, by the way. Those are five of my definitions. So the first one is resources. And these are tangible and intangible resources. One of the tangible ones is hard power. We see it on display in Russia and Ukraine. There is military power, there is economic power, that's hard power, right? The size of a country, the amount of men available to die in a war, it, it's horrible to say it like this, but it is part of power, right? Um, and that is hard power. Soft power is something else, it's intangible. So the person who, or political scientist who coined that term, Joseph Nye in 1990, he says, the ability to establish preferences tends to be associated with intangible power resources, such as culture, ideology, and institutions. This dimension can be thought of as soft power, in contrast to the hard command power usually associated with tangible resources like military and economic strength. If you think of examples, Hollywood is soft power. Uh, the royal family in the UK, the 
تقني <تصفيق> soft power right Hollywood stars soft power عندنا جولي soft power maybe I don't know not I don't I don't know the guy sorry anyway um, yeah so that's that soft power it's the ability to attract people to you basically to make them want to be like you or to act like you or to become like you smart power is a combination of both if you do it well so you deploy your tangible resources, but you also deploy your intangible resources to bring them to you. Because if you're smart enough, you don't have to invade people. You just make them like you so much that they do what you, what you want. And then there is sharp power. This we see a lot these days. Sharp power is about disinformation. It's about controlling what people uh, think about an event with the, uh, with the whole purpose of sowing discord. The Russian interference in US elections, the Russian interference in the Brexit campaign in the UK, Russian interference in practically every European uh, election or political life with the promotion of far-right ideology, that's also sharp power. The campaigns on Facebook for uh, spreading misinformation about all topics of interest, well, even in COVID-related, that's, that's sharp power. So we feel the impact. Of, of sharp power and it is dangerous and it's insidious because once you put a negative idea in somebody's head it's very difficult to take it out because it's much easier to scare people than to actually make them see sound so very powerful tactic. so another form of power is relationships and linkages between different countries different people as well different institutions but when we're thinking on you know in politics terms so you have the client patron state. So for example, in Lebanon, it's one country, but we have many patron states. So Saudi is a patron of the Sunni, Iran is a patron of the Shia in Lebanon, France is a patron of the Maronites, uh, the US is a patron of whoever else. Uh, and then, so, so you, have, you have these relationships between countries that support one another, but these can come through trade linkages as well. It's not always that you just give them money and they do what you like. It's, it's, uh, it comes over time as well, with repeated interactions, those are also linkages. So it's not always like negative or anything. But also within the state, for example, between the state and the citizen, there is also a linkage. But one of the important things to keep in mind is that some relation, some structural forms of power, which we would put under this, uh, cannot exist without both parties. You cannot be a teacher if there are no students. And you cannot be a prison guard if there are no prisoners. So even though in the relationship between teacher and student, the teacher has most of the power, but the students have power as well. Because without them, there is no teacher. There, there, is, no, there is no death why there is a teacher in the first place. So it's not always one-sided. That's important to keep in mind. And then the third form would be ideas and systems of meaning. So this is very abstract. So this is a quote from a book on Arab politics from you know, more than 20 years ago. It says, Arab leaders did not compete to increase their relative gains as measured in terms of military or economic power, but they did compete to establish the meaning of events. So of every, everything I read when I was Cambridge, this was probably one of the most important. Because you see it every day now, particularly because of the rising or massive <laughs> the ponderous influence of social media, that the story is everything. And assigning meaning to that story is what is important. So my example of COVID is not finished, the pandemic. There's people who would say yes, people who would say no. The January 6th storming of the Capitol in the US, there will be people telling you, ah, but these were tourists. They were just there to look at things. They just happened to trash everything. And there will be people like, no, they were trying to subvert the democratic election of the new president. And these are very different stories. Same for the Russian interference in the 2016 election. Was it there, was it not there? And so there is the reality that exists, but there is all the competing narratives of what actually that reality means. And this is the person or the party who wins that narrative, wins the politics. So it's sometimes not even important what actually happened, but how people understood it to happen. This is the danger of where we are in, and the importance of communication, part of it being visual and graphic. But, but this is, if everything that happens today, 
this is the most important. What is actually happening? Because people have a limit to how much they can understand and comprehend all of the shit show that is happening in reality. So they need to understand. And there is that competition of trying to explain to them and trying to get them to vote, trying to bring them to the polls and all of that. So when it comes to visual communication, <coughs> which forms of power can we as designers utilize? Because like I was saying, you can, like we all say, ah, design can change the world. And I don't think so. I think designers can change the world. Design is neutral. The, 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 the red hat from Trump that says make America great again, that's a piece of design and it's shit. The Nazi logo or the swastika, that's also a piece of design. And that definitely did not save the world. It's designers trying to amplify the right messages and helping and support the people on the side of right that can help save the world, but not design as a discipline. Because it can go either way. It's just a form of communication because what you say with it, it's the message, not the, not the medium. So, so what forms of power can we exercise? There is symbolism. So symbolism is very important because it's extremely powerful. <coughs> you know, in Lebanon, you can start a civil war if you go to a Christian village and you tell them, the Muslim village next to you uh, spit on the cross. Yeah, we get a civil war, basically. Or at least a slaughter. Or if you uh, burn the Quran, oh, you will get a civil war. For, for sure. Like, it's, it's just those symbols carry so much powerful meanings in them that if you use them, you are able to, one, get the attention, two, get people to react really emotionally and to grab them and to inspire them. So, for example, the bald eagle in the U.S. is one of the potent symbols. The Christian cross, the crescent, the hilal in, in, in Islamic uh, certain types of cultures. Um, but it doesn't have to be religious. It could be something else, right? So, uh, so symbols are very powerful because today reference ideas that mean a lot to the people. And so the symbol is a conduit between that idea and the person. So it's really, really strong. In, in communism, the raised, the raised fist, that's, that's a symbol as well. You just have to show it and you understand that you're talking about the fight of the worker against the degradation from, you know, aristocracy or whatever it is. Soft power. And so symbolism, obviously in design, I don't need to explain how we use it. No, we, we make symbols for God's sake and we use them in our designs. So these are super powerful. Soft power, I mean, obviously, when design is part of our communication, and it's part of the way that you engage with people, then again, this is soft power. The examples that Toshi showed, the posters, the Egyptian posters from the 1950s or 60s, these are gorgeous pieces of design that make everyone want to watch Egyptian movies. And because they're watching Egyptian movies, we all in the Middle East know how to fake, well, not all of us know it, but we all understand the Egyptian accent. We all sing the Egyptian songs, and some of us can fake an Egyptian accent. So that's a lot of soft power because it makes Egypt has a special place in our understanding of the region. Then narrative building. This is again something that designers talk about all the time. What is the story? What are you trying to say in your design? That's narrative building. What are we trying to communicate? What is that story? I mean, we didn't really say story. In, in, in politics, we call it narrative <laughs> building, framing of the situation as well. So this is really important. But then there is also assigning meaning, right? When we take events and we design a poster around them, or a book, or, or uh, an infographic, or whatever it is, we are able to assign meanings to those events that have happened. Um, one, like you see it in now in COVID times, uh, the wall with the little hearts. Um, uh, there's, there's all sorts of uh, the rainbow that the little kids were drawing and putting on the windows of um, of their homes during the first lockdown in the UK, showing support for NHS, you know, the medical workers, the frontline workers. This is not a piece of design by graphic designers, but it's a piece of design by the whole community because they're drawing and they're painting and they're looking at it and they're trying to communicate. Um, but then also preserving memories. That's also something that design does because we really like that's a lot of graphic design is resolved around that. And preserving memories is important because it seems that we tend to forget the lessons of the past. I mean, who would have thought the far right is going to be gaining grounds all over in Europe and now in the US again, given the horrors of the 1940s? How is that even possible? How? 
and yet it's happening, and they're actually proud. And so it's very important to preserve the memories, if only to preserve the, um, the lessons that have been done. And we can talk a lot about how much the West has forgotten the lessons that it should have learned, or have learned, and how complacent current generations are. And I don't mean the young guys, I mean everyone. <laughs> Anyways. And then lastly, identity forming, like who we are as people. And design is one way of actually making that. It helps form identities. The MAGA hat in the US, that's an identity for me. You see that hat and you know exactly what that person thinks. You don't even need to ask them. And that's it, right? So, so design has the capacity to, to influence who you think you are by simply portraying some design element or object. So when do we start talking about time then? There are all these pictures. <laughs> That was a serious part of the presentation. Now we can relax. Uh, it's going to be pretty from now on. So, um, I mean, in all seriousness, it, it is important, and the rest of it I will explain why. But and and my somber analysis of what's happening these days is uh, is, is one of the reasons. But um, so this is my mentor. This is Samir Shail. Uh, he was my typography teacher when I was at uh, the American University in Beirut a long, long time ago. He taught me a typography class. Jean-François and Véronique actually visited his atelier in Beirut. So this is him at his atelier. Uh, over here, this is the uh, one of the works of calligraphy that he does. He is a master calligrapher, one of the most avant-garde uh, Arabic calligraphers in, in the Middle East. An artist, an art critic, a writer, philosopher. He's a, basically a Renaissance man. And uh, he inspired a whole generation of Arab type designers. Like, if you look at who's who, in Arabic type today, most of them have a direct link to him, and it's not that it's indirect. Most of them. I mean, for Lebanese, like, for sure. Almost for sure. So, so he's been really, really influential. influential. And for me, I mean, he's my mentor, but he was the person who inspired me to even get into type design. So I took the course, it was 1998, and it was a really long time ago. And, and the reality on the ground then was that the Arabic typefaces available at the time, uh, they were shit. Yeah, sorry, by the way, I'm speaking like the really no, it's, this works more in London because they're really comfortable with all the swear words. So I hope you guys are okay with that. But really, they were horrible. And, and there was no variety. And um, really, there were no words. Because if you have five typefaces, I mean, I mean literally five, not figuratively, Literally five typefaces that were good and you could use in your graphic design work. How much variety of expression were you able to portray? Not a lot. What type of typographic expression, identity expression, hopes and dreams for your future? No, it was very, very limited. The quality was bad. The scope of what was available was bad. Poorly drawn, poorly executed. And with a vision of the Middle East that was rooted in a past that wasn't, you couldn't even be nostalgic for. And so this was a problem because it almost felt that like we did not deserve better. If the typefaces that set Arabic language looked so bad, it meant that we, when we design in Arabic and when we speak in Arabic, we did not deserve better than this. And that was not okay because we were primarily designing with Latin typefaces and designing projects in English and those looked amazing, and there were thousands of gorgeous looking typefaces, and we had nothing for Arabic. And at the same time, with his course, we were able to see all the gorgeous calligraphy that was part of our heritage. And for the first time in my life, because I was never very much into Arabic things, not so much when I was younger and before that time, but he showed that we have a heritage that we can be proud of, and with his work, he inspired us to take a look at Arabic calligraphy in a way which is not firmly rooted in the Ottoman tradition of the 19th century, and yet as a living form of art and design that can speak to our life today. And that was the most important lesson that he imparted to us, that we can change, and it can be different, and it can look good. <coughs> and so this is, this is why I got into type design, because I was a graphic designer, and I wanted more fonts, and there weren't any, so I had to design them. And I had to design for the Middle East I wanted, and not the Middle East that existed, or exists today. It's all still 
not okay. But anyways, so so the next section of the talk will be for, will be focused on what words I was looking for. Like what is it that I was trying to get to in these projects, and they are not in chronological order. So you might get we're jumping back and forth in time. So the first one is really the, at the heart of things. It's a question of identity. Like, what are we as Arabs able to say about us today and the future we want to build for ourselves? And the thing is, like, there is no one Arab. <laughs> that's, that's the biggest problem, that they think we're all the same, but we're not. Um, but there's also this question of, like, can we be contemporary? Can we be professional? Can we be scientific? Can we, can we be whoever we want it to be? Like, if you want to be a couch potato, you could be a couch potato. It's like, you're allowed. And you're allowed to be whatever you want to be. And that freedom we did not have. And, and we want that. So anyway, so in this project, for example, and this is from 2016, 2017, this is the Dubai project commissioned by the uh, Executive Council of Dubai uh, with Latin and Arabic together and uh, with the express purpose of having harmony between the two scripts. And this uh, fact-based family ships with Office 365 and is also available for free download and carries the name of Dubai. And so the, the brief was to create this fact-based family that would be used uh, as part of the Office, the Microsoft Office suite, but that can encompass the ambitions of the city of Dubai itself. And I was really happy that they accepted the design that I proposed that is simple and legible and straightforward and easy to read. And it's not fancy. It's not like this is the tallest tower in the world and this is the largest island of the coast and this is the largest frame where you look through it and you see this. Like, it's not that. It's just simple, it's functional, and it works in Microsoft Office <coughs> and it's available for free. And um, so the design is very straightforward type of design. And it's about the harmony and the openness that we see in their society. Like, obviously, there's a large asterisk there. Um, that we see this in the fact face as well. There's openness, there's simplicity of form, and there is harmony between the two without trying to make one into the other. So the design team for this was quite big. So Toshi was on the team. We were six in total. I designed the Arabic and supervised its extension. Then we had other people work on the Latin. Uh, so it's quite a big deal. But anyways, so this is project is. But the, the, I, I show this because this was part of the innovation sort of drive that they had in Dubai at the time. And the whole point was they were seeing typography and type design as a way of expression of identity. And this is people who were not type designers. Like, we always say, ah, type is the voice. Yeah, but to hear a client come and tell us, type is the voice, do something for me, it's nice. <laughs> you know. And then they let you do whatever you want. That's also nice. So, um, so that was quite a special project. And, and like I said, it's very easy, straightforward, nothing too fancy. It's all about just the comfort of reading and, and use in office environments. Then other words or concepts I was looking for, and this, like sort of the majority of my work fits in this, was to look for something that's more modern, progressive, but I don't know if you figured it out, but I'm very progressive in my politics. Something that looks professional and, and 21st century, but honestly, we are not living in a desert, riding camels, and sleeping in a tent. Like, some people do it for fun, but that's not how the Middle East looks. And, and maybe I should also say, if we design brands for that region, it doesn't have to have gold, and brown because it's the desert, and green because the, because the it's, it's in Islamic. Like, we can, we can do other things, right? So we need to go away from those shortcuts as well. But in any case, like, it needed to fit as of today. And so, so what I show now is just a series of different typefaces with small changes, but sort of something that could try to capture that type of feeling. And, and so some of the typefaces, uh, Noya Albatica Arabic, where I had to design the companion to Noya Albatica, and I have a love-hate relationship with this typeface. Sometimes I feel I did a good job, and sometimes I feel I hate it. But I also have a love-hate relationship with Albatica, so that also maybe it's fitting. Um, this is the universe next Arabic, and this is another attempt to try to see uh, how neutrality can work in Arabic. So both Arabica and uh, and universe are classic line of type typefaces, so so it needed to be something that would work with them, but they are a different design. This is Adrian Frutiger when he saw my uh, first design for Frutiger Arabic. He uh, actually cried. Um, he so I hadn't moved yet to line of type when they when they. Um, sent me this, my, my colleague sent me this, and 
he had written on this this way in German that like this work had a touch of genius, and this was in 2004. I was one year out of university. I like had achieved nothing in my career yet, and then he wrote that, and of course I cried. Like, what else will you do if you hear something like like well, you, you, you read it, you cry immediately and, and a lot. So anyway, so that was nice, and I got to design the Frutiger Arabic and the Frutiger Neue Arabic, all of those, and and so this is what the Frutiger Arabic looks like. It's used in airports all over the Middle East. It's also the most popular Arabic typeface of my designs so far. So everyone uh, uses this. It's quite funny because for many years, I couldn't see my typefaces in use because I was living in Germany and then the UK and now all over. But, and then at some point there was like this sudden shift where enough people had pirated my fonts. And so there was one time, I, I came back home, I was in the shower, I picked up the shampoo and there was a font on it. <coughs> Then I went to the fridge, not immediately, obviously, I put some clothes on, and I went to the fridge, and I opened the fridge, and then on the package of bread, there was my phone. And then I sit in front of TV, and I turned the TV on, and then again, there was my phone, I flipped the channel, and then there's another phone. And so, at some point, it was nice, and I almost caused a car accident. I shouldn't be saying this. The first time I saw my typeface, so for everyone here who is now a student, this will happen to you, try not to kill anyone. So I was in the backseat of the taxi, and we were in Dubai, and I had never seen my typeface on anything. Ever. And we were passing through this like tunnel getting in and there's like tight corner and then I see an ad for a real estate company in Dubai and they were using one of my typefaces and I screamed. And then the driver was like he almost crashed because like why I'm screaming. So so try to like not scream. I practice it maybe in <laughs> like you practice an Oscar speech or something. But it was really nice and you know for someone who's um, yeah, it's anyways, it's nice. I, I'm digressing. Okay, I'll go faster. So, uh, this is the Avenir Arabic. So, I've done a lot of Adrian Frutiger Arabic uh, companions too. Um, this is the SSD Arabic. So, another, uh, this was a custom project also when I was at Minotide. Um, and, and it was part of a large company, uh, you know, a large corporate typeface for Sony. Uh, so, in all of these different typefaces, I was trying to see like what would be a good typeface to sit on PlayStation. And this was my answer. Maybe other people can have a better answer, but when I was designing these typefaces, the Futiket Arabic, there was nothing like it, nothing. It, even the Alvati, it took a while before we got more, you know? But I was sitting there, banging my head against the wall, trying to answer the question, what does a contemporary Arabic typeface look like? And it's not something that necessarily you picked up out of the manuscript. That can work for something, but we have many other purposes that we have nothing for, and what can that look like? So it was always this struggle and anguish trying to get images out of my head. Um, I also want our Middle East to get out of the fire, I say, and, and get smart and advanced and have a little bit more hopeful look to the future and also to be a little bit more enlightened and read more books and, and uh, change a little bit. <laughs> a little bit. Anyway, so um, when I, uh, so this is my PhD project. And the PhD project is looking at the effect of the complexity of the word shape on reading speed using eye tracking. So I designed a typeface family of three styles with three levels of complexity. And I hired an eye tracker, a big screen, flew to Lebanon, sat at you know, schools, tested with children, and, and the result was that this, uh, so the, bra the black <coughs> version, this is the dynamic, the most complex, this takes longer to read. And we didn't have scientific evidence for that. We only knew that it looks prettier and it's more in line with our traditions. But the simplified is more in line with how we live today in newspapers. And I wanted to ask, this typographic tradition that we inherited because of complexities of technology or limitations of technology, does it still have a purpose in today's world when those limitations are almost completely gone? Is there benefit? And it turns out, yes, because when you simplify the shape, it becomes, up to a certain extent, obviously, it becomes simpler to read and faster. But in this process, I discovered that there is a beauty in the dynamic complex shapes. And I had never liked classical NAS. I actually hated it because it always felt like we're looking backwards, we're not looking forwards, and it's too flowery and it's too organic, and where are the straight lines? Right? And then eventually I drew this typeface, and I, through the act of drawing it, I sort of fell in love with the fact that you don't have straight lines, that it is complex, and there is this elegant flow of movement that is really charming and captivating. And then I, like, yes, it turns out it's less legible, but it's also beautiful, 
And actually, there's time for everything. And so again, it reinforces that when we come to type design, we come from a functional view, looking at what is the typeface meant to do, and then find the right typographic expression of that, rather than to come into type design saying, this is what I like, and that's all I'm going to do. So there was a really big lesson in that. And I did learn quite a bit out of it. This was for an installation in the Victoria State Library in Melbourne for when I was speaking there in 2013. So it says it is light, and a typeface cannot be divorced from the environment it is in, which is sort of the motto I go with. But in spite of all the beauty of Arabic calligraphy and where things are, we are still a region that is severely lacking in its freedom. Lots of security problems, particularly in Lebanon, but also I comment these days in the Middle East, everything is on fire. Uh, we people have no rights, and the future looks really shaky. And and so this, when people ask me what's your favorite project, I would show it's this one, even though I did not invent anything in it. Like normally, I try to break some walls and change some things, and that's sort of my contribution. I, I push and I make the design space bigger. With this one, it's very classical design. I didn't invent anything. I just drew something that is very bold and tense and stressed, and it packs a lot of power in it. So this, this sentence, Ya Jabal is uh, the mountain that will not be shaken by the wind. This was the one sentence I presented when I was invited to contribute to the design of a newspaper headline typeface for the largest daily in Lebanon, al Nahar, because its chief editor had been assassinated, uh, and his daughter came and she took over from him, and a few years later, she started the redesign of the newspaper. Design was, it was necessary. But there was also the larger political message that there, we will not accept the political intimidation uh, of, of the press, that we will have a free press. And this is one of the things that Lebanon is good at in the Middle East, that our press still has large degrees of freedom. And so what I wanted in this type base is to, is to pack power and punch so that when you're walking and you see the printed newspaper, it says, we are here and we are not intimidated. So I needed to bring like a very sculptural approach and to pack power into it. And in this typeface, this is simplified Arabic. This is not the dynamic, complex shapes of manuscripts. This is a purely typographic invention, the style at least, that was necessitated by technical limitations. And yet, there is beauty in it that will come and work for what we wanted to do when we have a newspaper headline that needs to shout. So again, there's another lesson that it's not that just because it's simple, it's not pretty, or that if it's complex and dynamic, that it's better. That no, again, it is the function of the typeface that decides if the typeface is good or not, which is why I hate the question, what's your favorite typeface? Because it's always like, yeah, but for what? Because it depends. Anyways. So, a little bit less of the politics. This is more about an ode to the beauty that we can find <coughs> in the world and the elegance and joy of spirit. So, I had the, um, and this was like one of the biggest honors in my life, no? I, I got to work with Professor Hanazla for over a period of 10 years, and we designed three typefaces together. This was me visiting his house in Darmstadt for the second project. And I remember Jean-François when I told him I was offered an internship at Type. I don't know if you remember it. And he told me there are two gods in type design, Adrian Frutiger and Herman Zaff, and they both work with Latin and type, and Herman Zaff comes to the office twice a week. So by the time I had moved to Germany, he was coming once a week, you know, once a month. But that was really the case, that I had this opportunity to work with him and to learn from him, and eventually to learn to draw like him. So this is a typeface that Toshi showed, that's the Palatino sounds Arabic. We, so we did three, this is the Palatino Saint, Arabic, and it's, it's, it's structured in a very classical way, but it's also informal and cute and looks good in packaging and stories for kids. This is the Zapino Arabic where I had to invent a typographic style that was not existing. It's a typographic interpretation of a calligraphy that has never been written and does not exist. So, and it was, um, yeah, yeah, anyways, so it's a little bit, it's, it's a bit crazy, um, but this is what it looks like, um, it needed to fit with the Zafino, I, I used to always call it Mount, my Mount Everest, it was one of the hardest things I ever had to do, I love most of it, but there's a few words that don't look good, so I have to tell you, I don't know why, but anyways, I'm compulsive, honest, yeah, anyway, 
Um, then, away from that complexity, going to reading and calmness, uh, the comfort, like, I wanted to design a typeface that felt like when you're sitting in front of the sea and the sea is calm, and there is that sense of comfort and, 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 and smoothness and peace of spirit. And also, the, uh, when you're sitting down to read in a comfortable armchair, and there's a floor lamp behind you and a little table and maybe a cup of tea or something, but you're comfortable sitting with a book and you're enjoying the reading process. And so it was important, but this was for screen. So I wanted an Arabic type is designed for reading off screen, which also at the time we did not have. And also with this one, I did not invent this style. This is a very traditional, like this is the sort of typeface we grew up reading. Um, but then it's less contrasted because we're seeing it on screen. And it's also about this comfort of reading, not too much movement, because Arabic tends to have a lot of movement. And I wanted it to settle down, to have a calm rhythm and calm energy. And I know that it worked because when I was designing it, I kept putting more text into my test document because like, I just wanted to read more. So I would stop the type design to read. And, and so that was good. So normally it's the other way around. Um, and then finally, this is the last section. So I'm not showing some of my new work. Only this bit is the new. Because the rest of it is just like more of the typographic sort of branding typefaces and international things. And we already spoke about so I'm not putting those here. But I've been more and more interested in exploring the like the, the, the boldness of type and the expression you could pack into it. So, so this typeface was the first one. It's called Hamra Street, and it's about it's a street in Beirut where I grew up, and it's the longest street and like very popular. And anyways, it, it represents a lot of things in Lebanon, and the intellectuals used to go there for cafes, and uh, it's mixed Christian and Muslim, so it's quite nice. So, uh, lots of lefties as well, but also boys. Um, and, and so this is the light version of it. And then this one, I usually don't speak about a lot, so I will not say a lot, but this is, um, uh, it's an exploration of grief. Yeah. So, and, and there's a version without any numbers. So it's about the blackness that you go through. And then this one is about anger. So, and this is the last story I tell you, unless you ask me a question. I, I spoke too much. Sorry, I'm glad you're still sitting, by the way. Um, <laughs> so this one is, um, it says, Kafa Kadiban, so enough lying. And it started because Trump was coming to the UK, to London, as the first, it was his first visit to London since being elected president. It was in 2018. And I wanted to protest him for his policies in the Middle East and the rest of what he did in the US, but also for the Middle East. <coughs> and I wanted to insult him, to speak to him in Arabic, because he's also xenophobic. So I thought it's just, it packs more punch into it. So, so I designed the poster, and I went and I uh, protested. And this is the protest. So, uh, so that's baby Trump, uh, the blimp. It was flying in, as part of the, and in London, they do the, the best demonstrations ever. Like, it's carnival, but they're protesting. So it's really cool. So they flew the baby Trump. You can see he's holding the phone. And, and this is me here, uh, also in another heat wave. Um, and it says, Kafa Kadiban, Kafa Karihan. So basically, stop lying and stop hating. And, and I thought that would be something good to tell to him. And I think it fits the rest of his party by now. Um, but yeah, so this typeface was an exploration of anger. And so I was designing this, and I was posting on Twitter and asking, like, does this feel angry enough? Because I was angry, because I knew what he was doing to us and that people will die because of his policies. And it has happened. And so, so I wanted to protest. And so this is a protest typeface. This one is available for free, by the way. If you go, I love typography. It's called Kata. The Sawad is also available for free. You can download it as well. I feel that the typefaces that I do that are explorations of feelings, I don't want to sell. I just want to give because I don't want to sell my feelings. So it's a bit feel more artsy in that sense. But uh, it's a new thing that I find really interesting. I'm also, um, I'm, I'm, well, I was working two years ago on a typeface around the theme of heartbreak, and um, I will finish at some point. Uh, but, but yeah, I, I think it's really interesting to uh, set away the design brief for a little bit, and then go and see what can you do with type, and how can you explode with emotions in it, and how can you communicate a state of mind, not <coughs> A typeface that is inspired by a brand and a brand personality, 
but in fact it's inspired by human emotion. And I think those are very different things. And these are different polarities in fact design, and we tend to focus on one, but it's nice to focus on the other one as well. Anyways, so this is it. Thank you. And for people who can vote, please vote on Sunday. Anyways, thank you. Merci beaucoup. Merci beaucoup. Ah, oh. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, maybe you have questions. Yeah. Thank you. You gave a beautiful answer to the question of Stefan Dagmeister. What you prefer? Good design for bad code or bad design for good code? No bad design for sure. Yeah, yeah. I'm political first, no way. But it's a good question. Thank you. Um, I was uh, wondering because I uh, have as French as I'm going to be French. When you when one works on uh, the Helvetica version, mm -hmm. uh, it seems that it's two cultures with two different uh, uh, way to to write. Yeah. Because in Arabic we still have uh, the idea of uh, writings. Yeah. And with Helvetica, it's uh, everything but writing. Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> how can you deal with these two things to create this design to put together. Yeah, I mean, it was, it was, it was very difficult yeah. because you're trying, I mean, Helvetica is many things, but one of it is the fact that there is no influence of pen movement. The shape is static, and you do not see the influence of the human. The human has disappeared from the grotesques in general. Mm -hmm. the and so what I tried, I mean, metaphorically speaking, you take the script, you bring an iron, and you just iron it. You keep ironing until you have removed the human. <coughs> Any, yeah, I mean, it's the, it's the style, no? So you keep looking at, does this look like a pen do this? Okay, so let me work some more until the, the shapes themselves do not look like a human touched them. And yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's what grotesques are, come on, no? <coughs> yeah, and it says a lot about the aesthetics of the day, but they... It's well put. Yeah, so, yeah. so, so but, and then, but the other thing is, and this is why my Helvetica is not the perfect Helvetica. My, like, the Helvetica Arabic is not the perfect companion because I could not make, yeah, I couldn't do it. I, I couldn't make the closed counter. It was, I, I couldn't do it. So, and, and my colleagues didn't know better. So, yeah, so I did, it, I did it how I would do it. So neutral, but not completely closed because in Helvetica, the letters don't want to live with one another. They, they don't want to speak. They want to exist in isolation, and there's a lot of neutrality in that, and that's why it works in branding so much. Because you have removed the human, and therefore, the things that make us different from one another, but also similar to one another, they're all gone. So it can work for many, many things. But in Arabic, I couldn't do it because, like the influence of the pen, the words have to hold hands. Like in Latin, they stay here, and the next one stays here, and then here, and that's it. In Arabic, like you hold hands. <coughs> There is no way you cannot touch the one next to you, you know? So that human still exists in a certain way. And I just couldn't couldn't do that closed, not so legible type of thing. So it's not it's not the perfect design. But but funnily enough, it functions perfectly where Helvetica would work. So for example, the Sky News Arabia, based in Abu Dhabi, 
is using Noya Helvetica Arabic and a special modification we did for them so that it works on TV. They're using it because the Latin is Helvetica. They're using the Arabic, and it worked so well that now this is one of the default typefaces all over the Middle East for news channels. And most of them are pirated because they're all using the Sky News version, so we know they did not pay for it, but they're using it anyway. So it just seems that it is able to do what the Alvedica is able to do, even though it's not really the same. You know? So I, I don't know if this answers the question, but yeah. Okay, cool. <laughs> So there was Hong and then Anna, oh, no, okay, and then okay. Um, thank you very much for your Thanks. talk. You're um, you said that you didn't think design can save the world, but designers can. Mm -hmm. uh, in the context of the world as it is, in your opinion, what do you think are some things that designers can be doing right now that would be most beneficial? Uh, it's like I paid you for this. <laughs> <laughs> I did not pay him to ask me this question. But okay, so we can amplify the voices of people who are doing good things. We can volunteer, we can advise, we can consult, or just pay them money, like work for the corporations and just give money, no? But basically, look for people who are working on the causes that mean something to us. For me, there is, you know, social justice, the, the whole progressive agenda for me, also equality, uh, women's rights, animal rights, climate crisis, <coughs> The horrible situation in the Middle East, like there's so many of them. And then you, you just look for the person who says what you want to say, but they have the platform, or at least the start, and then go amplify them. One of the reasons why revolutionary movements or progressive movements or people who are on the grassroots level, one of the reasons they fail is because everyone wants to be the hero in the story. But sometimes we need to coalesce and pick just one person <coughs> or a group and just amplify those. In Lebanon, for example, we had the, in 2019, we had what they call, it's a protest movement, but they call it a revolution, right? And then we had like 200 political parties out of it. They're all the revolution. And now there were elections, and they managed miraculously to get like 10 or 11 into parliament. But they were fragmented because everyone wants to be the hero. But sometimes what we need to do is not to be the hero. We need to find the hero and amplify their voice whichever way we can, and, and depending on the skill sets we have. But the, the first step is, first ask ourselves, what is important to me? Can I make a difference? And who can I help? And how much of my time can I dedicate? Because at the end of the day, like, we can afford to watch one less Netflix show, right? We can afford to, like, instead of seeing friends four times a week, we see them twice. And the two other times, we see like-minded people and we work on something, you know? So, but, but it's also, we do it in our profession as well. And this is, has been my focus in the last two years, because like what Leonid said in the introduction, I'm the CEO of I Love Typography. And the whole point of I Love Typography is to change the future of our community because we are deeply unhappy with the way it is now, because it is unfair with very abusive practices. And so we want to fight against that and we want to support independent families. And so we can look within our community as well. For example, we are mentoring families led by women or co-led by women. Because when we look, it seems that they think that just the fact that you can say there are women type designers, therefore we don't have a gender problem. The fact that we exist is enough. But no, we are not at the top, we are not leading. So <coughs> do we know about gender pay gap? We don't. So sometimes we start, we can also start in a small circle. See, who can I influence? And then who thinks like me? And let's band together and do something bigger. You know? But, but yeah, but just do something. Anything. Yeah. Anyway, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Nadine, for this uh, impressive uh, talk. And uh, I have a uh, question related to the very burning uh, news uh, regarding this South Korea art right? Because recently I wrote uh, an article about the, the the Russian type of sovereignty, uh, because uh, as you may know, uh, there is an economic sanction against Russia since the Crimea War, so mm -hmm. years ago. And in, in the bucket of the sanction, the, the, the Russians are forbidden to use, for instance, Ariel and Tanyuram. And some foundries like Paratype, which is a national foundry in Russia, uh, 
participate in a in uh, policy of import substitution, whereas they, they, they replace uh, type Norman and Arial with metric compatible forms. And also, Paratype is involved in uh, some jury of, uh, of Cyrillic uh, competition, like in Grand Champ recently. Mm -hmm. And they didn't make a, a clear stand about the position regarding to, to war on the opposite. Uh, yeah, yeah, Iliad and Yomov on uh, Type Today are made a clear, clear statement about that. So, what do you do with such uh, a situation? Yeah, I mean, to be honest, it's absolutely difficult because. It's a so the one thing we need to keep in mind is that it is not a democracy. People did not vote Putin in. He got there by abuse and by locking up everyone in jail, or it just happens that people who criticize him fall off balconies. It's just, it's the way things are. Balconies are dangerous in Russia. So we cannot blame the population for Putin the same way we cannot blame the population for Trump, because they're cut from the same cloth. Right? It's just Trump didn't get to do. There were checks on Trump, but not on Putin. But so, so that we need to keep in mind that he is not representative of every Russian. What we also need to keep in mind is that not every Russian has the freedom to say what they think, because it could be that in their own home they are threatened and they can be locked in jail. And there have been it's, it's been on social media. A woman got. Uh, arrested for holding up an empty piece of paper. So you can imagine the level of repression. No, no paper. It's no paper ever. Yeah. You do that. Also? Yes. Yeah. yes. Like you do that? Yeah, exactly. So, so when it comes to what is overt expressions of support or not support, we have to keep in mind they might not have the luxury. They might get into jail. And at the end of the day, that's not what we want. We want to inflict damage on that regime. That is more important than punishing type designers who happen to come from Russia. Now, if they were overt, you know, supporters and like trying to convince all of us, that's a different <coughs> conversation. But I would like proceed with a lot of caution with with people who have no luxury of freedom to be able to say what they want to say and to like be silent, you know? Because if they were I, I can't make suppositions, you know. So it's very, very difficult. To be honest, I, I don't know. And luckily, I haven't been put in a position where I have to decide. So I'm happy for that. Like, I'm, I got lucky. Um, but, but I would say that we, we need to just remember them as people as well. You know? Like, I'm very pro sanctions on businesses. But, but the human, we don't need to abuse, you know? So, or, or like discard too much. Because we don't know what that situation is. And generally, fact designs tend to be more liberal, most of them, in any case. So, yeah, I, I don't know if that helps. But it's just, it's the complex, there's no black and white in these things. It's, it's horrible. And that's the reality of war. Um, and, and we definitely condone what Russia is doing, this invasion, this illegal invasion. We're, we're here because they didn't complain enough in 2014, right? All of what's happening now should have happened in 2014. That's why we are here. But, uh, yeah, and I don't think it ends well. But anyway, sorry. I don't want to finish on depression now. So maybe we need a happy question. So like this, something nice. Don't mess well. Help. <laughs> I can show pictures of my puppy. That always helps. It's <laughs> a tradition now to have the Jean-François question. <laughs> Can I have some microphone? I have something to say afterwards. <laughs> no, no, no. Um, um, I'm not able to read around <laughs> like many people here. Probably majority. I'm not sure, but probably the majority. When we look to, um, I speak for all, but for in my own vision, so I'm not speaking for all, but that's a feeling I have um, of. When we look at typeface from a different script, uh, generally we look at them um, because um, they are maybe in old posters, so we have the feeling of the poster <coughs> image to try to understand the shape or what the meaning of the shape, or because this is uh, Arabic, Syriac, or you know, let, let's stay with Arabic, not add more complexity of the thing. 
that the Arabic version of the Latin. So we know the Latin, uh, we feel, so we understood the, Latin, the, the Arabic, because they are convenient, but you say something that uh, is disturbing in my Arabic, uh, Helvetica is not like Helvetica. On little sec, on little no, 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 I, I, I finish, but it's, it's a small joke. But, um, so it means that uh, when we look at typeface, and we are not able to read, to read them because it's in, in a script or a language that we are not able to read. The only thing we can see is that the shape. Some things is very difficult in Latin when you are a type designer because in all ways the world, you know, I have this joke all the time, um, since years, when people look at type specimen and say, yes, this, look, this, this typeface looks very Spanish, just because it's wrote in Spanish. <laughs> The typeface is not Spanish at all, but there is a word in Spanish that looks Spanish. Yeah. And here it looks Arab because it's set in <laughs> Arabic typeface. Uh, but uh, suddenly, with your explanation, uh, you put some words about uh, or your, your own personal feeling, which may be different from another type designer. So that's the first time in my life where you can see a lot of different typefaces on people who express emotion on feelings about the shape. That we are not able to read, but we are able to look at. But generally, when we look to the typeface, we don't know. That, does it like that because it's historical or reference of something? But you explain the emotion of the shape you draw. So the, the shape are suddenly completely abstract. And because you explain the shape, we are able to understand the shape. It's my feeling. Um, that's a comment, but I, I, it's not very clear to try to, but I, I try to understand. But the question I have for you and for also Toshi, um, um, so this part was a compliment in certain ways. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, so the real question is about, yeah, you have done a lot of Arabic typeface based, or not, I don't know, but some based on the Latin typeface. Yeah, quite a lot. Yeah, yeah quite a lot. Um, you are old. Designer, yeah, I, 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 not really but, I, it doesn't show, thank God, but like, yeah, it's been a long time. <laughs> uh, uh, Toshi, uh, uh, what Toshi have shown right before also, on, on, on what you explain with uh, different emotions and like that, on the way that uh, you have some even uh, demonstrations that Arabic letters are all connected, <laughs> or, or Latin are like that, and we try to, or to this, this way to explain. Uh, it means that I have the feeling that we have to learn from different scripts to improve our Latin, Latin typeface. Yeah. And, and for, until now, in your career, it's not a critique, it's just uh, I want that the, the, the thing change, mm. that to have more people, because there is probably more in the Latin world, because there is a lot of language using Latin, to be influenced by uh, connected scripts, mm. which can be Arabic, whatever, Magari, whatever, Try to bring back on the Latin with super rigid on separate on whatever some some feelings that you have you have a typeface like that. So yeah. I would like you or maybe friend of you or some colleagues or people that you have a soft power on them <laughs> to design like Latin typeface based on your Arabic typeface. Mm -hmm. That will be the next for the next decades. Yeah. That I want this such thing happening. So because before it was you influenced, or yeah. not influenced, but working on Frutier or that work. But now I want to have a Latin designer work on on Nadine Shine Arabic typeface on other Arabic typeface. Yeah. Cool. So we need to succeed to do that, or you need to succeed, or people have to yeah. look at that because we learn from other culture doing that. I see. Thank you. I, can I? Uh, I, I, I want something. an answer, but it no, 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 but it's I am not really yeah, sure. Thank you. No, 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 but I, I understand because there are. I, I think it's quite important to look. We've had like what five centuries of Latin type design. Yeah. There is a large degree of separation between Latin typefaces today, most of them, or actually the workhorse genres, and the people who wrote the letters these typefaces are based on. There is a large degree of separation. I once asked a question in class when I was still a student. What was the biggest influencer? No, not influencer in the same way to speak it now, but what was the biggest influence on the shape of Latin letter forms? And the answer I was given is punch cutting. And I don't think that's the right thing. 
it's still the way, it's the tool and the structure that form that letter form. But there has been this large separation between where the letter form started, their degree of evolution, and where they are today, that people, many type designers, have forgotten where the typefaces come from. And what is our intervention as type designers? Because you will hear a lot of like, I looked at a specimen, and then I designed. Or I looked at this typeface, and then I designed. And this means that we are designing in a space that has already been created for us, and we are not pushing those walls to become bigger. So, and this is what Cedars was about. So, for those who don't, who knows about Cedars, by the way, the type descriptor that I love typography. Shit, I need to tell you guys. But anyways, that's another presentation. But basically, like we created a type descriptor system to describe typefaces based on their forms and not on categories like old style, transitional, grotesque. What does grotesque say other than it is ugly? <coughs> or at least the people who called that genre thought it was ugly when they called it, you know, decades ago or centuries ago. So the type descriptive system describes the form that happened. And so we describe the structure, the energy level, the contrast, the axis, terminal treatments, transitions between curved and straight. And those come, I, I only came up with that way because I needed to understand Latin typefaces and what they do so that I can go do the same in Arabic even though they don't look the same. So I needed to strip away what does sans serif grotesque mean and actually look like what actually happens in a grotesque. That's why I'm saying it's the death of the human and it's same in geometric sans serif. No, we remove the human. So it is with that type of analytical view of Latin type design that we can make that space bigger. Because in the genres of geometric sans serifs, grotesques, humanists, it's practically incest by now. They're sitting, it's like, imagine you guys, 10 times people, and they're all sitting on your laps. This is the design space in, that we have in some of those genres. Because what people have done is they walk into this room, like, I really like this room and there's a lot of sales, I will sit in this. And no one has, very few people have actually thought, let me make that space a little bit bigger so that we can do more things in it. And it's because their entire description of the existence is the four walls as we know them today. And so there are very few people who actually can, Jean-François being one of them, and he's the one, the structure in Cedars, is because of Jean-François, because he taught me this when I was still a student. And it's a full circle, no? But, but the idea is that if we want to bring anything from Arabic into type design, I would hope that it's not that people design typefaces for my Arabic, is that they would look at Latin with an analytical view of why the letters look the way they do, and what needs to be there, and what can change, not with the purpose of sitting in one specific space, but for the purpose of exploration. And when we do that, then the space can become bigger, and then people are not copying one another. You know, then we have more innovation. Because otherwise, yeah, 10 people sitting on your lap, and it's hot and crowded, and you can't breathe. <laughs> you get the coffee. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> anyway, so yeah, it's not the, yeah, I mean, we, we need to do something uh, within the type design world. It's all pretty, but there's a lot of copies and me too design and that before me too hashtag. So it's, it's too much. And, and I think we need to go back to the reason why. That's why I really like how you teach here. By the way, he didn't pay me to say this. <laughs> but like when, when Jean Francois teaches, you understand why letters look like they do and where you can start and where is your intervention as a type designer. And it's not in tweaking the outlines, but it is in true understanding of the letter font. And that's where innovation happens, and that's how we need to teach. So, yeah, so I, my wish is more people teach like this as well. We're going to be trading wishes, no? So, anyway, Maxi, I hope this helps. And I'm sorry I talk too much, but it's getting really hot. I don't know if it shows, but I'm really sweating right now. <laughs> no, 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 it's never too much. Merci beaucoup, Nadine. Um, I think it's so much inspiration. Uh, for all of us, and uh, so much information that we can yeah, try to digest afterwards. Maybe one last question. <coughs> A happy one. No, no. <laughs> but it's, it's so happy and again so inspiring. Thank you very much to both of you for this uh, amazing lecture tonight. Thank you very much to be. That, yeah.